Hello, Satya. It's just outstanding to have you and to be in conversation with you. You are one of the world's most iconic leaders, and Fiki is delighted to have you at our annual convention. You know, there, there are a hundred questions that everybody wants to ask you, and you know, I did put it out on my Twitter uh, saying, I'm going to be in conversation with Satya, and what would you like to ask him? And there was just this tremendous response, but I, I picked two of those and a few of my own, so I'm going to go straight in. I think no conversation in 2020 uh, is complete without a question on the pandemic. So uh, just, just you know, jumping straight into that, how do you see the world changing? What do you believe is the role of tech? Just share your thoughts on the year 2020. Absolutely. First of all, Sungita, it's such an honor to be with you uh, and the entire community. Um, and, you know, to your point, this has been a year unlike anything else, right? I mean, none of us, uh, I think we last saw each other even at Davos, and none of us would have expected that uh, come March, uh, the level of constraints the world has been operating under uh, is what we would see. Uh, but the thing that I'm most uh, amazed by is the level of productivity. In spite of all of the constraints, Sangeeta, the fact that here we are, able to conduct the mission critical business, whether it's in healthcare, whether it's in financial services, uh, that is just pretty amazing. It's amazing because of all the infrastructure that has been built for us to be able to transcend, I would say, some of the constraints. But this has been the time where digital tech, uh, being that most malleable of resources, is being adopted at scale, both for core resilience, right? There's not going to be a single boardroom where they're not going to talk about digital technology as something that is nice to have. It's going to be core, not just for their future transformation, but for their business continuity. So that's, I think, perhaps the biggest structural change that I see. We see it in healthcare. You, you know, you are the expert. I mean, even the work that you are doing, and uh, which you were kind enough to speak at our CEO forum about, you know, telemedicine. We've been talking about it for decades. Guess what? Every session now will be, you know, an outpatient visit will start with an AI triage tool. Will then go to a, a, a sort of a, a video call, and then ultimately you may show up at the hospital, and that is going to be structural change. Same thing is happening in retail. Uh, you know, I was even talking to a small business in the United States that was able to do a quick pivot to curbside pickup uh, by just building an app for that. Uh, and so that ability to use digital tools to be able to deal with a tail event. Uh, because we can't predict what the next tail event is, but whatever that is, uh, I think our built-in infrastructure and capability around digital tech uh, is going to create resilience and transformation. And that, I think, is the most exciting thing to see. Absolutely. And, and I completely agree with you. So, Satya, just going on, what we you know, are talking about now is enhanced adoption of some of the foundational things that were put in maybe over the last few years or the last decade, those who had it, those who were ready, were able to adapt and change quickly. But I read something that you said, and I thought that was, you know, so significant. You said that Buddha didn't, you know, set out to find religion. He actually wanted to find the cause of suffering. And then you went on to say, you know, as life is playing its up and down, one of the things to, to understand and deal with is impermanence. And you said that before 2020. So just in that scope of impermanence, in that scope of change, but with the foundation of digital, where do you see the world going? Three years, five years out, where do you see the world going? The business of sort of change forecasting. It's a very dangerous uh, business because it's always uh, hard to predict uh, the future. But I think one can sort of look at what are the broad paradigms that are in fact reshaping uh, the expectations and especially the exponential curve, Sangeeta? I've always felt uh, that I've been able to sort of be, a, you know, navigate change whenever at least I understood that whatever that change is, it's exponential. Because if most of us as human beings are capable of adopting and adapting uh, to linear change, but we have a lot of discomfort around exponential change. And the exponential change, I think, is tech. Uh, and there are three layers of it, right? Whether it is the core ubiquity of computation, right? Even in the context of India, 
Uh, when I think about what is happening, the innovation in India around digital infrastructure in every field from financial services uh, to healthcare to uh, retail, it's tremendous to see. And that's because of the ubiquity of the computing fabric that's available to every Indian business and every Indian citizen. Uh, the layer of uh, you know, AI and data capabilities that now are getting embedded in every consumer and business experience and application, that's tremendous. The experience, I mean, the ubiquity of mobile phones in India has completely changed the expectations of what it needs to be self-service. So I think the exponential adoption of these three layers is what, in my mind, you know, is going to change a lot of what will happen. But to your point, though, is sort of very profound because we as human beings and as human societies can only deal with so much change. And so the question is, what is that social contract we have? between the government, the private sector, and the citizens and the broad civic society that allows us to create that harmony, to navigate this change together. Because if any one of us is changing and the others are being left behind, that's going to create more turmoil. Uh, and to me, that's probably one of the things, I think currency in today's world is how do you bring everybody together to navigate what are these exponential curves. What an amazing thought. And it, it really, you know, reflects what so much of your action, your thought about inclusivity. Uh, I love the fact that you keep saying healthcare, and I hope it's not just because you're talking to me, but because you deeply believe in the transformation in healthcare. Uh, but, you know, what you spoke about led me to, to jump straight into one of the questions which came out uh, you know, on my Twitter and from someone. And they said, what can uh, technology do to help public administration? Because, you know, we, we love, we love our country, of course, we love the world, but we see so many things which could be better if done differently. Uh, so how do you visualize technology change and public administration? Yeah, I mean, having grown up as a, a son of an Indian civil servant, uh, you know, I, I think quite a bit, uh, Sangeeta, about uh, public sector and also the institutional strength uh, of uh, public sector institutions is so important. I mean, in fact, it's living in the United States, uh, living in, say, the county I live in, uh, it's been, I am more subject to the state of the art of the public health institution uh, that has jurisdiction over the, in the county that I live in. And so we all sometimes think that, you know, it's just any one sector, but we need all of these institutions to be super strong. So I absolutely think uh, one of the foundational jobs I think all of us have is how do we get uh, the public sector to the efficient frontier of even technology use? Uh, and this is where I think some of the work that's happening in India, whether it is the ID system or the banking APIs or the payment APIs, or it's pretty enlightened. Uh, in fact, uh, I was even on another panel earlier this uh, today, and someone else was referencing India as a case study uh, of some real profound change being driven, uh, you know, across both private and public sector. So I think foundationally, I think job number one is to make sure that our public sector is being supported in their modernization. Uh, and then the public-private partnership is really helping adopt all of the changes more and bring about more ubiquity to that change. And I think that that's going to be very, very important. And I think that's one way for developing economies to be able to, one, recover from the pandemic, but more importantly, when we have talked about catch-up growth, I think it's absolutely possible in the next 10 years uh, Catch-up growth is possible when both the public institutions and the private sector, both in tandem, are able to move and, uh, and really move rapidly. So that, that's so true. And, and it is uh, completely right that there's some fantastic things happening in India right now. And we have a very enlightened leadership. So, you know, we are looking forward to a much better future just in terms of the way things work. Yep. Uh, moving on, uh, Satya, I think this is this was important to me uh, to really ask you because you know there are tremendous things that you have done. 
uh, you know, whether you, the way you pivoted Microsoft, the, the thought process of, of moving so intensely to cloud, your very famous uh, uh, ability to, to work with frenemies and, you know, you, you pulled out the Apple phone from your pocket in, in one conference. So it's not about what you did, but what was the thought process? And, you know, we've all read, hit refresh. We've, we've understand what you've done. But what was the thought process which helped you think through what to do? It's a fascinating question because, in fact, even as we sort of, you know, sit here today, the thing that I've been reflecting a lot on is what are the necessary conditions um, to be able to deal with complexity, right? I mean, I've been thinking a little bit like, you know, hopefully 2021, uh, spring, uh, summer, we have, the pandemic is behind us. How do we approach it? And uh, what exactly are the actions we need to take? And to your question, Sangeeta, I always go back and any time uh, I try to answer any question, I go back to two things. What's that sense of purpose uh, that drives and gives meaning to our organization? And what's that culture that we have inside the organization that helps us sustain and keep that center and center of focus. Uh, and so to me, you know, for example, when I when people talk, I've grown up in Microsoft now close to 30 years, uh, but I go back all the way to 1975 and the creation of the company when Bill and Paul said, hey, let's build a uh, basic interpreter for the Altair. The reality is in 2020, uh, that opportunity exists, you know, with a much bigger, you know, it's a much bigger opportunity because we want to create technology so that every organization out there in India and elsewhere can create their own technology, right? Because it's not about celebrating our tech, it's about tools for other people to be able to create more tech. And that, you know, gives us, I think, a real direction to what we are trying to get done. But the other part, Sangeeta, is also culture. I distinctly remember the first time Microsoft became the largest company in the world was late 90s. Uh, and quite frankly, from ancient times to modern Silicon Valley, the only thing that has sort of gotten in the way of sustained success is hubris. Uh, we all thought that, you know, in the late 90s that we were brilliant, except, you know, you're only as brilliant as your ability to learn today so that you can do something more useful tomorrow. Uh, and so having that learning posture, and this is where borrowing that growth mindset meme from Carol Dweck's work in child psychology has been so helpful to us because every day you have to sort of confront the fact that you are imperfect, but you can learn. And that helps us stay grounded and centered on your mission. So this, you know, although it's overused, overtalked, I feel like those are the only two truths that one has. Uh, the only two pillars one can fall back to when things get, in fact, more confusing, your sense of purpose and mission and your culture. And once you have that, then you have to get a lot of things right, but your chances of getting all those other things right, like strategies and tech picking and people picking, become so much more easier with these two pillars. So that's fantastic. It's, it's culture, it's purpose. So this from the man who's created, I mean, you have been called one of the largest wealth creators of the decade. So culture and purpose are at the core and the foundation. Thank you for that, Satya. Uh, I, I think as you know, we move on just, just a little bit longer, but uh, you know, the whole world is shaped by multiple things and it is, it is culture, it is people, it's the vibrancy and the buoyancy of a population, uh, it's startups, it's, you know, it's a hundred things. But what do you think as leaders, you know, what should leaders kind of do? Because they don't just shape their own company. They shape the environment. They shape, you know, the lives of so many employees. So, so what are your leadership mantras? You have a whole lot of leaders out there listening to you right now at the FIKI convention. And, and so what would you kind of say to, to leaders of, of India and leaders of the world? I mean, one thing that's saying that at least I like to sort of hold a mirror to myself, quite frankly, is on three attributes, which I think are the attributes of every leader. Uh, and so in some sense, each day I ask myself whether, uh, how did I do on these three? And the three that I really reflect on is, leaders have this very innate capability of coming into ambiguous, uncertain situations and creating clarity, right? You don't 
ever have leaders who come into an uncertain situation and create confusion. They just bring about clarity when none exists. Second, leaders are great at creating energy, right? I mean, you know, when somebody, you go walk into a room and you're amongst a leader or you're with a leader, um, they create energy for everybody. It's not just, oh, my team is good and my company is good, but they just bring about, you know, energy for all the constituents. And so that I think is the second uh, capability of leaders. And then the last one is, we can't wait for the perfect pitch, right? I mean, I can't say, hey, look, I can't, you know, let, I'll perform after the pandemic is done. I mean, no, you and I and everyone in the room has to keep working in spite of what the world throws at us. Uh, and that ability to solve sometimes the over-constrained problem is what leadership is all about and driving success. So to me, creating clarity, generating energy and driving success uh, is what I think leaders innately are capable of. None of us are perfect. None of us are perfect all the time. Uh, but as they say in cricket, uh, you know, you know, your class is permanent even if your form is temporary, and you have to keep practicing that. So, so perfect. You led me into my final question. Uh, the pitch is so important. But if you were given an option between a cricket game, the World Cup, and the Super Bowl, which one would you choose, Satya? Well, I mean, you know, I love my Seahawks and. Uh, uh, it might be a tough call, but I'll still probably go for a Cricket World Cup if India is playing for sure in the finals. Okay, that's so cool. Uh, India loves you, Satya, as does the world. You are a global icon, and thank you so much for being with Vicky, for being with us at the convention, and for the great inspirational leader that you are. Thank you. Uh, we truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sangeeta. Thank you very much.